the um, especially with the Spanish speaking bands, I, a lot of that was organized through the trombone player in my previous band, Party Like It's um, uh, Pedro. Mm-hmm. And he, he speaks Spanish, so he did a lot of our translating and a lot of that connecting and logistics. Uh, Clemente, I think, I want to say he hit us up directly on Instagram or something like that. Mm-hmm. Nice. And then I, and I Googled him and I was like, oh, this guy's for real. Yeah, no, for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's definitely been uh, leading the charge out here in LA. You know? Yeah, and he was really helpful too because a lot of the footage we have in there is his foot. He's a great photographer and he shoots yeah. video and stuff. So yeah, exactly. Like on on top of being in the movie, he also helped us out with with footage and all that stuff. That's awesome. You know, uh, something else that you guys covered in the movie, uh, you guys made it a point from the beginning. Uh, ska music is Jamaican music, you know, point blank period. You guys made that point very strongly. And I loved how you guys elaborated on the blending of like mento, jazz and blues. And that's all that stuff is really insightful because like along with the gatherings at the Jubilee Gardens, uh, you know, there's the uh, it was it was Coco Co- 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 Molan. Yeah. yeah uh, I, you know, along with all that, I also interviewed recently a singer from Jamaica. She's from Rockford, Isha Bell. And she would vividly describe the community would just kind of hang out at Scatterlights rehearsal. You know, uh, uh, one of the coolest things. Things I thought you guys were doing was uh, like shining the light on the disc jockeys too, on the sound systems, you know, because so, like as students, when we do our homework, we see like the purpose of what they're doing with that was emblematically, they're trying to kind of convey the circumstances of the, the African diaspora with that, you know, and uh, um, along with that, not only that, you put it together in Pick It Up that those same sound system uh, operators would bring bands in and it would serve as a better like uh, platform to actually distribute musicians. You mm-hmm. know? We, when we go back and listen to like, you know, Tony Rebel and all that stuff, like a lot of those mixes, it's like real bands that he cut you know and it's like uh you know is there any like uh, sound system djs you find yourself like going back listening to and like trying to find like the rare cuts off the off like the bootlegs or uh did you grow up with with uh, or did you did you ever indulge in that in that sound or you know i like a good dj night and i'll listen to it but i don't collect those records and i don't i don't have favorites i don't search that stuff out that's it's mm-hmm. kind of um i'm like a third wave ska kid gotcha. i like i like a lot of two-tone but i don't really go back go back much further than that um a lot of that history stuff I felt was really, really important to put in the movie. I thought, you know, the odds are most people who watch this is going to be the only thing they ever learn about ska, right? They're not going to go do more research. So we got to put in all these things. Um, and that's why we brought in Heather, Heather Augustin, um, who wrote all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And she's written a bunch of books on ska that are super like, you know, if you're doing your research, you got to read her books. Yeah. Um, so it seemed it seemed like a perfect fit. Because, you know, as much as I don't really like seek that stuff out and listen to it, I know the people who do are such a huge part of the ska scene and it's it's really important. And there's a lot of times there's like tension between the traditionalists and the third wave mm-hmm. people. And we just kind of wanted to set that aside and try to just include everybody, bring everything together and say, look, ska is for everybody. It's, you know, you don't have to like all of it. You can pick and choose, but it's it's a big umbrella we can all stay under. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't really listen. I, yeah, I listen to more or less than Jake and less, you know, of course, less yeah, Jamaican yeah, yeah. But I love it. You know, it's great when it's on. I just don't seek it out. Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, lady you're you're talking about that wrote the book. It, it was the it was the lady in the in the movie, right? Giving the interviews. Yeah. The perspectives. Yeah, we met her then yeah. doing the interview, mm-hmm. and and when we got home and realized we needed some narration, we needed something for Tim Armstrong to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, I just called her up and said, hey, would you write this? Because you're the expert. You know, she's done all the research. She's been to the places. She knows the people. So um, oh, nice. So it was like all you guys collaborating on his narration or? Yeah, I mean, she wrote it all. And then we hired this this great animator to do the animation, yeah. which I loved. And Tim, you know, he had his input too. He's he's just yeah. like an encyclopedia of Scott knowledge, you know? Of course, yeah. No, I thought that was dope. You know, it, it was crazy when, when it, like every time she would give like a perspective, I was like, I, I honestly had not heard of her. You know, until mm-hmm. I start hearing her like come out, like when you guys are interviewing her, um, she has really insightful things to say. And, you know, I see that she's an author. I'm like, I'm definitely gonna read her stuff. But now mm-hmm. that he says she wrote like the narration, that, that makes a lot of sense. Cause like uh, a lot of the rhythm of like what he was saying, it was kind of like, kind of lining up with like her, her her vibe when she was talking to you guys. And and, and yeah. another thing too, uh, whoever did the animation, great job on that, man. Because uh, he, he got it on point, man. Like I, I think it was a, it was, it was a moment where um, they were talking about Mighty Mighty Boston's the, uh, 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 Ben Carr, right? The guy that, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, uh, Big D's lead singer, I forget his name, but he was uh, like, Dave McQueen. He was like, oh man, I can just picture a big like record exec with a cigar in his mouth. He's like, no, we don't need him. And like the animation yeah. was like perfect on that. I was like, dude, that, that's, that's sick, man. Yeah, I guarantee you that happened. There's some record exec that probably, <laughs> sure. probably tried to talk them out of it, but they were so established by the time they were on a major label that, it was no you know, th no one was going to tell the Boston's what they could and couldn't do, you know? Exactly, <laughs> they, exactly. They had yeah. built it up for, for so long that you know yeah and i mean my, my awesome other ones you know yeah. they're also responsible for so much you know along with that appearance and clueless uh as you guys touched touched on this and, and pick it up um they're 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 first like you know and as you just said their first mainstream hit came after they're so established all those full-length albums what's your yeah. uh boston's album if you don't mind me asking that i mean i love let's face it it's like i think it's one of those perfect records where mm -hmm. there's no there's no bad songs on it, but like mm -hmm. Devil's Night Out and you know the the earlier the first I forget I heard them on on something this is like Where Did You Go or um man I don't know mm -hmm. I, I it was one of those things where when I heard them which was probably from Clueless I went on there was this thing called Columbia House okay. right where mm -hmm. you would you get like twelve CDs for a penny nice. and then you you'd end up you're in a club and it was a scam and you'd have to pay for it and it's <laughs> before your time but basically uh -huh. you'd go and it'd be this catalog and i had barely heard of the boss tones but i was like this is amazing i got it so i would get all the records they have and they they had a bunch because they'd been around so long mm -hmm. so what happened was i got them all at the same time so in my memory i it's all one you know i had like a five cd changer and i would just put all the boss tones in and push random yeah of course yeah. very much like spotify now or something yeah so because i got all the records at the same time it's hard for me to say like this is the one it's more songs like here and there yeah but that's very unique. Like it's only because they had been around so long that you could, you know, the day I found out about them, I could get six records. Yeah. You know, it's not like when when Real Big Fish hit the scene and they had one album. Gotcha. Yeah. And a demo yeah. before that, or like yeah. any of these bands that would come out and they would have, you know, say Ferris had one album. So with the Boston's, it was it was like a flood, maybe even too much music all at one time for <laughs> you know, a fourteen year old kid to be like, what am I gonna? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's like how so I never got that experience of just like listening to one album for a long time, except for Let's Face It, because that came out later, mm -hmm. a couple of years after. And I was able to sit with it, which is probably why it sticks with me more. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. Um, you know, circling back on, on, on the topic of two tone, you mentioned it. Um uh two tone, like in the English Scott scene, uh when we go back and listen to those records, uh the music and the look of all those bands to me was very strong and direct, uh, because in a sense they were creating a sort of like symbolic catalyst for like a uh, racial unity. As you guys also touched in the movie, it was a lot of mixed peoples in, in all the bands. I mean, uh, you know, through their presentation and, and everything. I mean, mo most had like lyrics directly going against subscribers of like prejudice ideologies, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, and, you know, calling them out. And like those bands having songs that hit the charts, as you guys touched on, uh, it was obviously the tunnel through which America uh, 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 kind of got the music through two tone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, uh, today, uh, it, it was kind of like touched on a little bit that, you know, the, the, the music got uh, like like funner once it got. Um, how do you feel about like political ska and, uh, and, and punk, I guess? Because like, you know, for example, um, it seems like two tone rec with the two tone records that went, that went mainstream and maybe Maybe like this isn't really ska, but maybe like Rage Against the Machines moment that they had in the '90s as well. Uh, political music kind of got swabbed from like the mainstream for a while. Why do you think that is? Why do you, why why do you think it, it like the spotlight kind of like uh, 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 got pushed to the side? Because at the time when the labels were exploiting those bands for what they did with their with their art style, uh, it was working for them. You know, yeah. Rage Against the Machine uh, was 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 making big social impact is, is another question. But the way that they were being presented through the label and everything that they were doing, I mean, it was working. You know, and it obviously worked for 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 all the two-tone bands that came out as well in terms of the yeah. label giving them that presentation and the labels kind of left it alone in your opinion what, what do you think uh like happened there within the music business i th i think rage against the machine is a great example too because you have we're seeing it now right with black lives matter movement happening um and all of these issues coming up and uh you're seeing people just now realizing that rage against the machine was a political band you know i think the people that just heard them on the radio and the same with the mighty mighty Boston's, right let's face it is a political record yeah. um but the, the singles were not so political so people would hear it on the radio and never connect those things even though the bands were trying you know they were doing 
they, they were doing the work. They were writing the songs and putting them out there, especially Rage Against the Machine. And that's mm-hmm. like, and even when I was a teenager in the 90s, I understood that they were political, but I didn't know enough about politics to understand, you know, like that Rage Against the Machine is like the opposite side of the spectrum of my dad. Yeah. Because I didn't know, I didn't know enough about politics to know, you know, even right. what what my dad's opinions were and what this band's opinions were. And uh, as I get older and learn more, um, you do start to connect those things. And as far as why the labels did that in the 90s, I think it was just a different time. You know, there was a bigger gap between independent artists and the mainstream artists. Mm -hmm. You know, um, MTV was making or breaking careers and radio was still king. And it was really hard to find the less popular bands. So I think they just didn't want to alienate anybody. So much and also the 90s were a different time especially in america where the economy was doing a little bit better we weren't it it wasn't like the late 70s early 80s in europe the two-tone came out of where there was all this strife and racial tension you know they were dealing with that directly at the time that it was happening and then america would hear it later and maybe not connected so much because it was a different culture Mm -hmm. but the music was so good that (laughs) you couldn't you couldn't help but get into it so i don't know i mean we talked to like angelo from fishbone is super political and they've always been and that goes really far back fishbone and the bostones too yeah were super political going back you know into the 80s mm-hmm. um and they had mainstream success of course. both at different times and different levels and i i sometimes wonder if all the fans realize it you know just like with the rage against the machine like are people just listening to the music and having a good time or are they listening to the lyrics and connecting the message and i hope that they are i mean i'm i'm a fan of bands that have something to say as much as i'm a fan of bands that just sing about beer and getting out of your crappy small town <laughs> I got it you. all matters, right? It's all great music. And um, also some people don't have as much to say, mm-hmm. you know, especially yep. 90s, like white kids in California in the 90s. What, what are they going to rage against? I got you. Well, yeah, Disneyland, of you know, so... <laughs> I like that Ska has all of that. Yeah. The very, very political and the very benign altogether. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you this, like, kind of to go along with your point of, you know, uh, are people just kind of listening to the music and having a good time or are they really analyzing the lyrics? Uh, I think it depends. Um, I think people don't analyze the lyric. uh, Excuse me. I I think it's easy to analyze the lyrics because you can hear them, but I think people don't analyze the scenes maybe. But yeah. I, I think the music, as you're saying, uh, it is kind of like a, a universal language. So I think people will always pick up on like the melodies and, and be able to get into the music, you know? Yeah. And I think that's also why things like the Ska Against Racism tour in the 90s was so important, because that was exactly that. It was taking these bands, whether they sang about politics or, you know, racial issues or not, and putting them on this tour. People were going to see their favorite bands, but just even like Mike Park says in the movie, just call calling it Ska Against Racism and making people think that was a big deal. You know, you can take these bands that were singing about whatever, but you put them, it's like you're saying, it's the scene. Mm -hmm. You know, the Ska scene has always had this anti-racism, anti-bigotry vibe to it, which, you know, whether it's in the song or not, it's in the culture, right? Yeah. It's part of it. Uh, and, you know, like you also mentioned Fishbone, like, which is still so important today, you know, um, especially for uh, like a lot of my friends and I, not only were the songs so good, they, 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 uh, they, they broke a lot of barriers down. And something that you guys touched on a lot in the movie was being at the right place at the right time. Um, yeah, especially with Fishbone. I know like Angelo's philosophy is very much like make good music that people can dance to and then sneak in the political message, you yeah. know, while they're while they're having a good time. So it makes perfect sense that they would do that movie and be, you know, silly. And I'm sure there are people who saw them, went out and bought the record, and then maybe connected with the message because they did that. Same with the Boston's doing Clueless. Mm. You know, getting more people to listen to your band and then getting your message across. Especially back then, that's how you could do it. It It's like there wasn't social media. You couldn't listen to a band and then see their tweets to know what their politics were. It had to be in the music or you just didn't know. Of course. Yeah, how, how was interviewing Angelo, by the way, man? That's that's like, you know, <laughs> that's Angelo Moore right there, man. <laughs> it's great. He's a legend. And he's, uh, he's such a cool guy. I don't know if you've seen on the, the DVD, we've got the bonus I like, seen outtakes that. with, oh, with yeah. Angelo. And he was, we went to his studio 
in LA and he, um, you know, he sat down for the interview, but he also just wanted to show us, you know, oh, check out the song I've been working on. And he starts playing his, his uh, organ and he's playing the drums and he's just like laughing and having a great time. And mm-hmm. uh, he knew Ray, who was working on the movie with me from before they had worked together. I think okay. Ray like helps him 